start um, right on time because we're going to have to end this lecture today at 11.40 um, because there is a large event that's coming in here at noon that's a catered affair, and so um, the room has to be vacated um, in order to allow them to set that up. Uh, we left off um, not quite through the Royal Pluses, and I want to pick up where we left off. I cannot get these lights to work the way they're supposed to work. I apologize for that. Now those come on. This is crazy, crazy, crazy. Okay. Um, to talk about the, um, the Plus Vendome and the major point that I want to make about this, which is that each of these projects are individual projects. And what we do not see is actually the connection. Now, there were ideas about this and there were plans for this, but, but it would take another two to three hundred years. In fact, it would not be until the middle of the 19th century that um, all of the straight streets and so forth would actually be implemented that connected these up into a single unified field that is the Paris that we know today. Uh, the last of these uh, royal places that we will talk about is Place Vendôme, which is in some ways the most peculiar. Uh, it's a quite complex story because um, it was actually property that was owned uh, by the Duke de Vendôme, who ultimately owed money to the crown uh, to settle the debt. The land then was uh, purchased or given to uh, the king, who then, on what was called a concession basis, similar to uh, what we see in the Place Dauphine, where uh, the, the king owned the land and then had an agent who developed it, and then the king got a certain percentage for fronting the money. And putting up the land. Um, in fact, it would not be until the 19th century that capital formation in the modern sense would come into being. Um, that is, private people investing in something. This was a sort of hybrid, and it, um, it, it's a long and a complex story, and I, for, for the purposes of this course, we don't need to sort of understand all the background of it. But I want to point out a few things that are make it somewhat interesting. The first is that you'll notice this enormous equestrian statue of, of, of King Louis XIV um, in the center of this place. And then you'll notice in the place today, there is actually something that looks an awful lot like Trajan's column. The column replaced uh, the statue after the revolution of 1789 and the coup d'etat that put Napoleon I in power. Uh, the column was then erected by Napoleon um, in which all the cannon that he used from all of his famous battles were melted down to create this bas-relief in metal uh, that wraps it a la the column of Trajan. And of course, rather than having Trajan and then later St. Peter on top of the column, we have the Emperor Napoleon. Napoleon, however, fell into um, disgrace and was sent into exile. And um, it would not be until he was, his reputation was sort of rehabilitated um, during, the second during the Second Empire after 1851 that we would have the column re-erected in its form today. There we actually see the statue of the king destroyed first in the Revolution of 1789, replaced by the column in 1802. And the column pulled down in the revolution of 1848 and then rebuilt during the Second Empire between 1851 and 1879. This is actually of the, col the first column that was, that was pulled down from this old, old, old daguerreotype uh, from the revolution of 1848, known as the first Paris Commune. Um, that gave us, by the way, the term um, uh, avant-garde because it referred to the advanced sort of uprising people in the barricades here that where streets were blocked and this is foreshadowing because it will play into the story of uh, the second empire in the 19th century in which these straight streets were cut through the city in part to move troops and to prevent riots from breaking out as they were uh, want to do in 
France between the end of the revolution, uh, the coup d'etat that put Napoleon in power, and then the stability that finally came in the Second Empire of 1851 under Louis Napoleon. Uh, however, the Paris that we know today, the Paris that, uh, that we love, the Paris that has 64 million tourists a year, <laughs> um, or whatever it is, it's some enormous number, sort of the entire population of Spain ultimately um, visits Paris, um, not actually Spaniards, but that number of people uh, visit the city every year. It's one of the great cities of the world, I think. And, um, it is a long and complex story. I thought you'd like to see it in 1944 during the Nazi occupation. And uh, at the time that this was built, by the way, all of these ground floor arcades that you see in these sort of regulated heights are not there. That will not come until the 19th century. And, um, but it's, it's based, the 19th century city is really based upon these precedents that were set in motion by Henry IV, carried out all the way through... Um, into the reign of Louis XIV, who was on the throne for 60 years and um, consolidated the monarchy finally into the modern nation state. And those precedents actually were um, sort of exploited to some degree uh, by the landscape gardener, uh, the landscape architect, I think we would call him today, Andre Lenote. And this lecture is ostensibly about that. So Place Vendôme, as it appears today. Now, it turns out that and the long and complex story that um, created Place Vendôme, um, they ran out of money, and they didn't have enough capital to actually fund the construction of the whole thing. So they, um, the architect, Jules Ardouin Mansart, actually uh, constructed, they constructed only the facades of the buildings. So if you sort of look at this, you can see these regularized facades here, but you will notice in the back that actually they're all different in the back. Different buildings are attaching to that facade. Whoops. And that is not unusual if we really think about it. It seems peculiar to us today that we would build something like that. But if we were in Atlanta, someone was to build a new uh, subdivision of single-family houses somewhere uh, out in the suburbs, typically they would buy a piece of land. They would put in what? They would put in the infrastructure. You would put in the streets. You would put in the sewer, you'd put in the utility, uh, and then you would subdivide the land into a series of lots. And then you would sell the lot so that the developer's end product is the improved lot. The lot would then be acquired not by an individual, most likely, but by a builder who might build in any given year five, six, seven houses. Right? There are some builders who will build the whole thing out as one single development. But uh, that's less than 10% of all new single-family home construction in the United States, which is built by people who are essentially small businessmen, uh, sort of entrepreneurs, who are building fewer than seven houses per year. That's an extraordinary thing. So if we just take those lots, those improved lots, subdivision, and we elevate them to a designed facade, uh, what we have, in effect, is this, so that you could buy segments of the subdivided uh, facade, right? And then you could build whatever you wanted to build in the back. And if you look at this actually uh, carefully, what you will see is that the firewalls and the divisions and the chimneys and so forth actually are at different intervals in relation to the facade because of that, of that peculiar uh, circumstance. I think it's actually an extraordinary story. But from an urban design standpoint, um, it, it, it is irrelevant, actually, um, at least in the purpose of this course. Now, we talked about these um, boulevards that came roughly at the same time that the city was expanding and the royal places initially began under Henry IV. Um, this space at the base of the wall, which was then, uh, when the wall came down, converted into a street. And because the walls were circumferential, as Wycherley says, um, loosely, like the Greek city, loosely flung about the city, um, and the walls keep expanding as the city expands, the defensive walls, when the interior walls came down, um, they were replaced by these circumferential streets. Uh, these will become known as the boulevard, as the boulevard. And um, it's a French word, French term, and there is a corresponding term, uh, which we will see the origins of today, which is called the Avenue. Now, today, 
um, and, and, and actually going all the way back to the 18th century uh, in England, these terms get confused and they get conflated. And boulevards uh, today sort of mean something with trees planted down the middle or something. Um, and avenue and boulevard are actually conflated and hopelessly confused. But they were initially um, very different, very different streets that had different social, economic, and political purposes. The avenue is simply a contraction of a apostrophe venue to a place, to a venue, so that Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. does what? It connects the Capitol building to the White House, the legislative branch of government to the executive branch of government, the avenue, right? The boulevard, because it was associated with the space at the base of the wall and was a wide street that then was built after the wall came down, um, is actually circumferential. So what you have is something like a wagon wheel with spokes, the avenues being the spokes and the rim actually being uh, the boulevard. As I said today, we, we call, there's even a street in Atlanta just called Boulevard. There's even a Boulevard Street, and in the history of names, that's probably in the top five, I think, of all time oxymoronic names of Boulevard Street. It's sort of like, if I was speaking Chinese, it would be uh, the Lushan Mountains, where Shan is mountain, okay? Right? It's, it's a strange, it's, it's bizarre, like jumbo shrimp. It's, it doesn't make sense. So, um, <laughs> so we, Atlanta, of course, is a perfect example of, um, of, of bizarre names having 71 streets with Peachtree in it, which I'm convinced was created. There's even a West Peachtree, by the way, which is east of Peachtree. Think about that for a moment. Um, talk about confusing, um, particularly for, the, I think it was to confuse either the carpetbaggers that were coming down from the north or the pizza delivery guys in some prescient way that um, they could not possibly have, have foreseen. That's, a, that's supposed to be sort of funny, not really, but kind of. Anyway, uh, so what we have then at, um, at the beginning of the reign of Louis XIV in 1661 is actually a series of these small projects, Place Dauphine, Place de Vosges, Place de Victory, uh, the great palace here of Palais Cardinal, renamed Palais Royal. And a couple of you after class were confused. Uh, Place Royal, after the revolution, is renamed Place de Vosges. This makes no sense. And Richelieu's palace, which was the Palais Cardinal, because he was a cardinal, was renamed Palais Royal um, during the reign of Louis, the Philippe, Louis Philippe after the revolution. It was a brief restoration of the monarchy, and the royal family moved into it. And um, actually, Louis XIII moved into it, as a matter of fact. And so it was renamed uh, the Palais, um, Palais Palace uh, Royal. It's a little confusing. Place Vendôme, which we've already discussed, and then the Tuileries, which was a garden that we'll see in a moment more of, which was associated with the extension of the Louvre that was constructed originally by um, the first Italian queen, Catherine de' Medici, who preceded Marie and who was married to an earlier king, Henry II, uh, in the middle of the, of the uh, 16th century, who preceded Henry IV. Now, what you'll notice about this, there are other ones that are proposed, never built, um, that we see here. But uh, what you'll notice about this is that although there are proposed extensions of streets that we see here from these round, point, round points, <clears throat> or to use the French term star, étoile, um, the streets don't connect up to anything because actually they had to cut through the fabric of the city and as I said, it would take about 200 years to actually um, achieve that. Uh, but uh, the point I want to make is that the precedence for what Haussmann and, and in the Second Empire will do between 1851 and 1879 is already set. And there are the beginnings of this that occur with the extension of an axis out of the Tuileries Garden uh, across an open field, which was known as the Elysian Fields. In French, that is the Champs-Élysées, and that would be known as the Avenue des Champs-Élysées, one of the most famous streets in the world. 
There we see an aerial photograph of it just so that you can see the way that these remain, even today, somewhat isolated and embedded within the fabric uh, of the city overall. This is Place de Victorie that we see here. Uh, this is Place Dauphine, very prominent there because of its position in relation to the Pont Neuf, and here Place de Vosges. And then uh, we see the Tuileries over here. This is the Louvre. There is the Corps de Logis, or the original building is still embedded within there that was built by Philippe Auguste in the 13th century um, outside the wall of the city. And then the extension that we see here and a palace that was constructed across here, now missing, now torn down, burned down in the revolution of 1871, the end of the Second Empire. And uh, the garden, as we'll see, was actually um, associated with that, with that palace, thus the Palais de Tuileries and the, um, and the Jardin de Tuileries, the Garden of the Tuileries. Called Tuileries because there were clay deposits there in the old floodplain of the of the Seine, and it's where they dug that clay out to make roofing tiles. Thus, Tuileries, <coughs> Place Dauphine, Place de Vosges, Place de Victorie, Place Vendôme, uh, Palais Cardinal, Palais Royal today, and um, so let's take a look then at Richelieu. As I mentioned, Richelieu has generally in the popular literature not been accorded, has not been very kind to him. He was, however, um, far from being the sort of evil guy who was plotting against the crown and so forth, uh, as, as, uh, as the popular literature would have us believe. It was, he was, in fact, the person who sort of consolidated and stabilized France after this incredible period of turmoil at the end of the 1500s and the first decades of the 1600s. Um, he moved back to his uh, home town or his home estate. It was out in the country in the Loire Valley. And he constructed for himself a villa. Now, in France, this would be called a chateau, um, castle, in effect, chateau. But, um, but it was really uh, based upon these Italian villas that he had experienced while he was a papal legate in Rome. And uh, again, he was trying to set an example for the nobility of what they should do. And if, if the message was pretty clear, if you want to actually be a sort of a major player in the political landscape um, of, uh, of Europe as it was emerging at that time, then you need to sort of uh, behave like it, you know, act like you've been there before. And, um, and you should build in a certain way and the sort of uh, avant-garde, the modern sort of form of that at the time was, of course, sort of headquartered in Italy. Uh, this is the chateau that he built for himself uh, in this sort of Italianate manner, although the French were never fully successful at that, and even though they would model them, the, what they built after these Italian examples, even though um, Italian even though um, French architects like Salomon de Broche and Etienne de Perac would actually go, in the case of Etienne de Perac, would go and be an apprentice to the Italian architect um, Piero Ligorio, and would actually come back with measured drawings of things like the Villa d'Este. Um, what was built was actually, it's, it's for lack of a any better technical term, I would say it looks French, you know, uh, even though it's based on, uh, it's based on these Italian precedents. Now, the reason we're talking about Richelieu is that he, um, these villas, of course, had a working town associated with it. And uh, as I mentioned, the purpose of the villa was not uh, that you would actually derive income necessarily from, I mean, if you go to Biltmore House today up here, um, built by the Vanderbilts, built by George Vanderbilt, the largest private house ever constructed in the United States, uh, designed by William Morris Hunt, I believe, and Frederick Law Olmsted. Um, it's really a beautiful place and an extraordinary thing, 40,000 acres. Now, they had a dairy and they had a winery. Wine's not very good, um, but the ice cream's pretty good. But, uh, but the Vanderbilts didn't make their money um, making ice cream, right? They, how did they make their money? Shipping, railroads, so on and so forth, right? So um, same thing here. This is the, But they had a working component to it to make it to make it plausible, to make it seem legit, then you would experiment with scientific farming and other kinds of things like that. In the case of Biltmore, uh, 
the United States Forest Service began there because he owned 40,000 acres. And uh, he actually brought Gifford Pinchot uh, around 1900 from France to the United States to manage his forest. And then upon George Vanderbilt's death, uh, that was donated as the first national forest in the United States. Right? Uh, and Pinchot was appointed the first uh, head of the, of the U.S. Forest Service. So in, the, in, in our course here, the significance is not simply this villa. These, there were quite a few, this uh, chateau, uh, with its formal gardens and its sort of court de logis here, but with its Italian elements added in, the central axis and the cross axis coming down here. But this part that we see here on the left, on the upper right, we see a plan of the village that he, which is where that term comes from, it's attached to a villa, um, this village which uh, he constructed for the workers. This was for the people who worked on the estate, on his estate, worked for him. And, and I find this to be an extraordinary thing. I had never heard of it until 1980 on a Saturday morning when I was driving around and accidentally stumbled into it, saw it on the map, knew who Richelieu was, thought it would be interesting to find out what this was read a little bit about it, and sort of drove there and stumbled into it early on a Saturday morning in 1980, and I almost fell over dead when I saw it. I could not believe what I was looking at. This was built by the architect, designed by the architect Jacques de Mercier in 1830. And remember that this man, Richelieu, was a Roman Catholic cardinal, all right? But he built this town with two public sort of pluses here in a simple little gridiron plan, not too different from a Bastide or these planned towns that we would have seen before, based of, or based upon some of the principles that were beginning to percolate up out of Italy on the ideal Renaissance city. Rather, I uh, fell over dead because, um, actually, that's a metaphor. I'm not dead. Close to it, but not quite. I um, get closer every year. <coughs> but uh, because this Roman Catholic cardinal had built this church facing on to the public plus, right? Okay, so far so good. But in the same position, opposite that, he built the market. Hmm. So here we have a church, this symbol of, of authority, traditional form of authority, and yet it is holding the same seat at the table, so to speak, as the market building is. You see why that's significant? You get a seat at the table. You got me? And that seat at the table... It would be like in the president's cabinet if you went around and there was the president and the provost and uh, the vice president for administrative administration and finance, vice president for research, the six deans, and 15 students. The students are now sitting at the table along with the president. You follow me? So uh, this is a bit of a change, a substantial change in the sort of concept of a hierarchy of, uh, of these traditional forms of authority. And again, this point I'm making about in France, what we see is that these royal places, even though they were built in concession to the king, essentially by the king or the king's agents, or by a Roman Catholic cardinal, actually has a secularizing um, aspect to it. It's speculative real estate in the case of Place Vendôme. It might have a statue of the king in the center, but the program is to actually build housing. And here, this is not only housing, but we actually have here at the uh, first plus that we come to here, the market building occupying the same position relative to the public space that the church occupies. Now, during the Revolution, all symbols of the monarchy and tradi these traditional forms of authority, this is the big revolution of 1789, um, the mob throughout France, uh, pretty much destroyed anything that they thought was associated with the monarchy or the church. In fact, in Notre Dame, uh, this is sad in a way because on the facade of Notre Dame de Paris uh, are these statues, and the statues are actually the statues of the kings of Judea, right, these biblical characters. But the mob didn't know that. They thought they were the kings of France, and so they smashed they pulled, uh, climbed up, pulled all the statues off, and smashed them. We see this all the time. You see this in, um, in um, you know, uh, revolution anywhere. You will see the, tr the symbol of the government. I heard on NPR yesterday that in Nigeria, just uh, day before yesterday, 
um, unfortunately, this rebel group um, destroyed um, the oil pipelines. Now, that's the primary income for this country, uh, Nigerian, big country, 100 million people almost. Um, and of course, the rebels weren't clearly thinking very clearly because you don't destroy your infrastructure, right? You don't destroy it. You, you, I mean, that doesn't make sense. Um, but they associated the, the infrastructure was owned by the government. We are opposed to the government, so we will blow up the infrastructure owned by the government, not realizing that had they been able to to achieve some sort of political solution which would have changed government, then you would not have destroyed uh, all the infrastructure and the capital investment that's going to be required from somebody, World Bank, somebody, in order to rebuild that, which is going to provide you with your primary source of, of export income. Um, tragic, actually. Well, same thing went on here. Uh, so they destroyed the, um, uh, the, the chateau completely. The only two things that remain is this, uh, you can see where the Cour de Logis was, there's a canal that runs around it, and you can sort of trace the outline here of the central axis, and then there are two small buildings designed by the Mercier uh, in 1630, 1636, which exist back here in this kind of exedra form in the garden. Uh, but those are the only two things that remain. The property was then transferred to the University of Paris, but what they didn't destroy, what they didn't touch was, of course, the worker village, right? That was that remained intact, and it is intact uh, today. So let's take a look at it. Now, the remarkable thing about this is that we have then, following the precedent, it's actually this comes before Place Vendôme, uh, so this is actually a precedent for the Place Vendôme. Here's the church opposite the market. The water supply is in the center here. And then we see these uniform facades that were built all around these sort of two public squares, and the central street, and then the intent was that all the facades, like Place Vendôme, would be controlled, uniform facades. And then behind that, you would build whatever you needed to build. So when you walk down here today, you may have a, an expensive apartment building, you may have uh, an automobile repair shop, you may have a place that makes donuts, you might even have a girls' school with a basketball court, right? But they're all unified by um, this architectural move, which was essentially to create these uniform facades all the way down the street. This is the cross axis from the front of the chateau going down into the town. There we are crossing, um, I'll show you where we are. This is this uh, sort of exedra shape that we see right here, and that gate that we see there is this gate that we see here. We then move directly into this um, <coughs> public place. Sorry, these were old 35 millimeter slides that I had to scan, and so they're not the best photographs in the world. Uh, I keep trying to find substitutes for these, and slowly I'm doing that, but I'll probably be dead by the time I'm able to <laughs> swap them all out for something I can find on Wikipedia somewhere. But, um, but here we're to the right of this, where that car is coming from, uh, is the church, and to the left is the market. Now, you'll notice these trees, and I want to mention this tree uh, because you notice these kind of gnarled, knuckle-like things that are sort of sticking up here in um, on these. This is a practice that the French engaged in because it comes from viticulture, the growing of grapes. And in the growing of grapes, uh, you actually today, by law, Certain classifications, the Grand Cru's in Burgundy, for example, which are limited to 30 hectoliters per, per uh, hectare, um, prune back those grapes and only leave three, th three vines coming off the stump. You get about 70 years out of a vine, and then you grow them up, and, and they're sort of controlled. Well, this goes way back into the fact that if you reduce the total amount of bloom or the total amount of the, of the, of the vine um, that is actually having to get nutrients, and you're going to get better flavor in the grapes that are remaining on these other vines. Plants, <coughs> some plants are, have what's called adventitious growth, and some do not. And some uh, adventitious growth means that if my arm was a branch and I cut it off here, I would grow new hands at the point of the cut, right? Uh, but um, so certain things like chestnut trees, 
um, grapes, crepe myrtles you've seen where people will cut them off and then they put out new growth at the point of the cut. It's like sucker growth, but you're controlling where that goes. Certain other plants, like uh, an oak tree or an elm tree, if you cut the leader, you've cut it off. It's like cutting off your arm. You're not going to grow another one, right? Um, and so there are these, these differences. And this practice comes from the practice of pruning back the vines to, pro to produce a, a, a certain kind of um, cultivation of grapes, a certain flavor, what they call terroir, uh, takes all the minerals and puts flavor in it, or to produce more bloom or to produce less bloom or something. But you prune that back hard. The stumps in February will be that big out of the ground. That's it. In the great the great vineyards in France. Um, and so they began doing this uh, to these trees. And plane trees, what we call sycamore, um, but a sycamore in the ancient world was a fig. This is actually called a plane tree and um, has this adventitious growth. So if you cut it back at the same point every year, you'll get this kind of gnarled appearance. And then this new growth will come out at that point. And this will become significant in a moment. So here we have then a better view across the, uh, there used to be a fountain in 1980, that was the old water supply of the town in the 17th century, it's been taken down and replaced by this rather pathetic architectural feature here, uh, <laughs> and um, I don't know why they took it down, that thing was great, um, and you're coming in from the gate here, there's the church, and then directly opposite the church is this is this market building, really extraordinary building that would still function. So on a Saturday, when they have Saturday market, all those the, the it's lined with stalls of fresh fruits and vegetables and meats and cheeses and all kinds of wonderful things. Uh, and then from the uh, that first plus, we look straight down this axial street through the gate of the town and out into the countryside. And you'll notice here that the facades are, for the most part, absolutely uniform along that straight street. Same uh, architectural uh, feature. There's one here that must have burned and they rebuilt it and somebody got fancy. But, um, you know, here we have, I've got a better idea. I'm going to rusticate mine. But anyway, this is, um, this is uh, what, it, what it looks like. Now, if you go down that street and you look in each one of these doors, um, you will see residential buildings, ground floor retail, like the old Roman insula, charcuterie, um, but you look through the door, and you'll see a courtyard. And in that courtyard, you might have a garden. If it's a residential building, uh, it might actually be a gas station and an automobile repair shop where you get a new muffler or your brakes fixed. The next one might actually be a Catholic girls' school, complete with a basketball court and a chapel. And there we see a little bit better. And then here we see an example of a residential building. A lot of retired people there today. Um, uh, that contains this, this garden. Now, with that in mind, I want to go back to Paris and back to the Tuileries and to talk about this extraordinary man, Andre Lenote, who sort of uh, took a lot of these precedents that were already out there and actually transformed um, the whole sort of architecture of, of the French garden and did so in a way that ultimately set precedents for what would come 200 years after his death in the 19th century for the reconstruction of, of the entirety of Paris. Um, the Tuileries, actually, as I mentioned, was associated originally with a garden, the, a, a building, a palace, a royal palace that was here. And if we sort of look at this side over here, down what is now the Rue de Rivoli, we'll see in a moment there was a small village over there, not unlike what we would have seen um, not quite as architectural and not quite as designed as what we would see um, at Richelieu, at the, at the Palais de Richelieu, but there was a village there. Those people who lived in that village worked for the king, uh, and Andre Lenote grew up in that village adjacent to um, this garden. Um, his grandfather was, remember there's a palace here, so there's a, a wall, a building, and there was a small garden here called the Petite Tuileries, and his grandfather um, Pierre was actually the superintendent of the Petit Jardin of the Tuileries, and his father, uh, Jean Lenote, was actually um, the superintendent later of the Tuileries itself. So Lenote grew up in this gardening family, and he was the first person um, 
to in which the, a gardener uh, actually attended the Royal Academy, attended the uh, equivalent of the Ecole de Beaux Arts, and his classmate was the was the architect uh, Louis Laveau, um, and their classmate was uh, the painter Charles Le Brun. And this trio of Lenote, Laveau, and Le Brun would go on to build what is one of the most famous buildings in the world, Versailles, along with a whole lot of other stuff. Now, Lenote is interesting at a number of levels, and one of the things that makes him interesting is that his official title was Jardinier du Roy, the gardener of the king. But on the pay vouchers, he is listed as chef d'architect, chief architect. So he was actually in charge and the superintendent of the whole the whole thing at Versailles, but I'm getting ahead of the story. So, and by the way, I wrote an article about the creation of this, which I may upload, in the Place de la Concorde, which I may upload later in the 19th century, I may upload uh, in the course folder for your reading pleasure, since you're running out of things to read. Um, so if we look at the position of this in the old city of Paris, there's the Ile de la Cité, uh, here is uh, the Palais Cardinal, and then we see now this extension out of this garden, which extends all the way up to the ridge at Chaillot, um, C-H-A-I-L-L-O-T, uh, which, um, which actually is the horizon from the Tuileries, where it was then extended later down to back to the river. And there we see that large bend in the river that I was talking about that comes all the way back around here. And again, later that will become significant. Um, you'll also notice that from this point, there's a second avenue, which is constructed here, which was originally called the uh, Avenue of the Empress, Imperatrice. But uh, this was leading to a royal hunting park, which is called the Bois de Boulogne. Now, in um, when the Louis the Fourteenth was nine years old, eight years old, his father Louis the Thirteenth died, and um, and during this period of instability. Uh, I mean, the France at this point has a nine-year-old king. Um, <laughs> and um, Cardinal Mazarin steps in, similar to what Richelieu did uh, for Louis XIII. But riots break out. And um, so the royal family believes, the mother of uh, Anne of Austria believes that Louis XIV is actually perhaps in danger. And so in disguise, they attempt to flee the Palais de Tuileries in the middle of the night. And they are discovered as they exit uh, the garden, uh, crossing what is now Place de la Concorde, going up to Champs-Élysées. And um, the mob begins to throw rotten fruit at the carriage. And a piece of fruit, don't know what, um, came into the carriage and hit his mother in the face. And this is something that the king never forgot, and he swore at the age of 10 that he would never set foot in the city of Paris again, and he never did, and thus the motivation for the construction of Versailles and for the iconographical program of Versailles, which is not simply about the megalomania of the king, but about these uh, Greek mythology in which he saw himself being protected as a young Apollo being protected by his mother, Latona, at a very early age. Point being, they took refuge overnight in the royal uh, wood here, which was the Bois de Bologna, until they traveled on to his father's hunting lodge at a little place called Versailles. And Louis then decided when he became, when he reached his majority age, at the age of 18, he decided that he would, in fact, in 1661, build a new capital for a new France at Versailles. Um, which we see uh, here. So if you look at the entire Paris Basin, you can then begin to see the extension of this axis up, connection, connecting to the Bois de Boulogne, and then down here somewhere we see Versailles, and uh, we're going to go there in just a moment. But um, there was a notion at the time that you would have these sort of royal avenues, highways, but avenues which would connect these important things to a venue, to a place, a straight street, A to B. And uh, it was never fully implemented, and as I said several times, it will take um, a while before that happens. Well, they ended up here. Now, the original uh, building is still in there, 
Uh, it's often referred to as the uh, pasteboard chateau. And what we see here by Laveau is actually the, uh, what Louis XIV built. And it uh, housed eventually 10,000 people. Now, if you think that somewhere between eight and 10,000 people, if you think that it's just the megalomania of the king, again, this was the capital of France. So he had all of his ministers there. He had his interior minister, all of his generals, everybody all sort of set within this, within this uh, extraordinary chateau. Um, if you came in late, we, um, the caterers are coming in right now for an event for, uh, that is occurring here at noon. And so we have been asked to um, accommodate that by vacating the room as quickly as possible. If you were not here and did not get your test back, I have them, and I will do that out in the lobby. So if you could just gather your stuff, we will pick up with Versailles on Monday, and um, let's vacate the room as quickly as we possibly can. Thank you. <laughs>